This episode of The Sweaty Penguin is brought to you by Self-Help Books. Want to feel like you're improving yourself while still avoiding your responsibilities? Try Self-Help Books today. Okay, fine, we can talk about the paintings. Good Wednesday morning, I'm Ethan Brown, and this is Tip of the Iceberg, where I will break down some environmental news and then answer a question from our listeners on the air. Submit questions via Patreon, email, or social media. Patron questions go to the front of the line, so sign up at patreon.com slash thesweatypenguin. The Sweaty Penguin is presented by Peril and Promise, a public media initiative from the WNET Group in New York, reporting on the issues and solutions around climate change. You can learn more at pbs.org slash perilandpromise. If you're not familiar, there have been a string of stunts recently with climate activists targeting artwork. In May, an activist smeared cake on the Mona Lisa in France, adding new meaning to Marie Antoinette's Let Them Eat Cake. In July, five activists spray-painted No New Oil underneath a copy of The Last Supper in England and glued their hands to the frame. On October 9th, Two activists glued themselves to the glass covering of a Picasso painting in Australia. On October 14th, two activists threw tomato soup on Van Gogh's sunflowers painting in England. On October 23rd, two activists threw mashed potatoes on Monet's grain stacks painting in Germany. They could have at least been on brand and thrown cream of wheat, though. Missed opportunity. And finally, on October 27th, Two activists glued themselves to Vermeer's Girl with a Pearl Earring painting in the Netherlands. What's next? Ice cream on The Scream? Guacamole on Guernica? Berries and broth on American Gothic? At this rate, by the time this episode comes out, there's not going to be any art left without food or glue on it. Since you're probably wondering, I haven't been the biggest fan of these protests but it hasn't taken up much space in my head, to be honest with you. I never expected to actually do an episode on it. If there's anything I do agree with the activists on, one, it is really tempting to touch the artwork. Like, wow, if I could let intrusive thoughts take the wheel for a day. Watch out, the David. And two, they kept saying, why do people care more about us throwing food at paintings than the future of the planet? It's a little bit of a weird argument, right? That's like your kids smashing your TV, and when you get mad, saying, why are you mad at me when there's corruption at the FIFA World Cup? Like, okay, but really? That said, yeah, I do care more about climate change than I do about paintings, which is why I haven't gotten all that riled up about these activists. If anything, as someone who finds museums incredibly boring, I'm just baffled that someone would want to glue themselves to one. But let's talk about an aspect of this activism that is interesting to me, and maybe a little more productive to discuss. One of the groups involved in some of these protests is called Extinction Rebellion, a UK-based international coalition that uses nonviolent civil disobedience to draw attention to environmental causes. One of their branches also tweeted that the sweaty penguin seems like climate denial, but that's neither here nor there. But one phrase on their website caught my attention. Historical evidence shows that we need the involvement of 3.5% of the population to succeed. Other environmental groups also cite this 3.5% number often, And while I acknowledge that they know a whole lot more about activism than me, I'm not sure it's a good idea to let their strategy be influenced by that number. The number 3.5% comes from Dr. Erica Chenoweth, who is not Kristen Chenoweth's alter ego, but a political scientist at Harvard. Dr. Chenoweth studied over 300 movements from the past 100 years, 
and found that if a movement mobilized 3.5% of the population, it never failed. Well, all except the movement to bring Vine back. Based on that research, some climate activists have run with the idea that if they get 3.5% of the population mobilized, they're guaranteed to succeed. But there are a few problems with drawing that conclusion from Dr. Chenoweth's research. First, Dr. Chenoweth's data was limited to maximalist campaigns. And before you ask, no, this does not refer to campaigns where everyone wears bold and crazy mismatching patterns and giant chunky earrings. Maximalist campaigns aim to overthrow dictators or achieve territorial independence, and because of their black and white nature, it's much easier to classify them as successes or failures. Issues such as civil rights, women's suffrage, or environmental causes were not included because the definitions of success and failure within those movements are too broad and complex to measure concretely. So it may be a little premature for environmental groups to use the 3.5% rule. That's like rodents deciding to adopt the golden rule. Like, no guys, humans are supposed to treat each other the way they want to be treated. You're supposed to eat half your offspring for nourishment, apparently. Yeah, that's a real thing. Second, the 3.5% rule has been broken before, and Dr. Chenoweth expects it to be broken even more in the future. With technology and social media, it is a lot easier to mobilize 3.5% of the population now than it was 50 or 100 years ago. Hell, 3.5% of the entire planet's population is not much more than the number of Charlie D'Amelio's TikTok followers. And if she mobilized them, God, think of all the flash mobs we'd have to deal with. But third and most importantly, the 3.5% rule refers to 3.5% of the population protesting, and not everyone chooses to express themselves via protest. To give you a recent example, in the summer of 2020, about 6% of Americans participated in Black Lives Matter protests, but 67% of Americans supported the cause. That means less than 10% of supporters physically mobilized. And that's not a bad thing. You can express support for a cause in other ways. You can donate. You can vote, which, by the way, is coming up on Tuesday. You can do what I chose to do and be a writer or podcaster or other type of communicator. You can just talk about it with family and friends, preferably at Thanksgiving dinner in the most condescending way you can possibly think of. These actions are valuable too. And given the aforementioned statistics, I'd imagine if 3.5% of the population is protesting, then at least 10 times as many people are not protesting, but supporting the cause in other ways. Without those other forms of support, your 3.5% would quickly become a small fringe minority. And that's what it seems like environmental groups might be missing. According to a 2021 YouGov poll, only 19% of people in the UK hold a positive view of the Extinction Rebellion. First off, can I just say, imagine knowing from a poll how many people have a positive view of you. You're in therapy like, no one likes me, and your therapist is like, well, actually, according to a Quinnipiac poll, 8.3% of people like you, 32.6% think you're boring, and 59.1% think you're too short, so there's your answer. But back to the Extinction Rebellion. Low as it may be, 19% is more than 3.5%, right? So by their logic, mission accomplished? Actually, far from it. The Extinction Rebellion has never come close to mobilizing 3.5% of the UK for a protest, and to do that, they'd need the support of a whole lot more people. That goes for any environmental group. I don't mean to single them out, even though they insulted the sweaty penguin on Twitter. I'm over it, I swear. None of the protests from Dr. Chenoweth's research started with a magic 3.5% number on the minds of the organizers. Rather, they tried to gain the support of as many people as possible, 
and they garnered so much support that 3.5% of the population joined in on protests. Honestly, it's frustrating to think I could quadruple my audience by slingshotting oatmeal at the Sistine Chapel's ceiling. But after two and a half years and over a thousand pages of podcast scripts, I'm happy with my choices. The majority of the world isn't going to cheer on vandalism of artwork, no matter how many memes Lil Nas X posts about it. Whereas nuanced, critical stories about climate change, which emphasize how issues affect not just the environment, but also the economy, health, justice, security, everything we care about, and show a variety of possible solutions to pick from, yeah, I think that has the potential to bring together a large swath of the public. I'm not saying activism doesn't work. Obviously, it has many times throughout history. But it won't work if you have 3.5% of people on the streets and 96.5% of people tweeting about how ridiculous you are. You need a lot of people on board, and I've always wished more climate activists made that effort to appeal to a broader audience. One more parting thought. When asked why they performed these stunts, some of these activists expressed that they wanted to get climate change in the news. As a journalist, that really made me think. We in the media have a responsibility to report the news, and there is a whole lot of climate news. If we can't talk about climate change without someone throwing soup at a painting, what are we doing? From September 24th to 28th, ABC, NBC, CBS, CNN, Fox News, and MSNBC aired 1,020 segments about Hurricane Ian. Climate change was mentioned only 46 times, with seven of those featuring explicit climate denial. Really? And after the storm hit, we had scientists almost immediately publishing analyses of how climate change increased Ian's rainfall. That was not an abstract connection. So if I take anything from these protests, it's that we as journalists need to do a better job putting climate change on the front page. It's embarrassing, really. We should not need activists getting themselves arrested to motivate us to do our jobs. I guess the same could be said for politicians or CEOs or anyone else, but as a journalist myself, I... Oh, my soup is ready. Relax, it's just my lunch. Are life's inconveniences stacking up on you? Do you need help taking charge of your life? Well, self-help books are for you. Here's a secret. If you spend the next 26 hours reading this book, literally every single thing in your life will become easier. And the book only costs $53.99. What a steal! And to think I only had to cut down three forests to print these. Self-help books. Procrastinate your procrastination. The Sweaty Penguin is presented by Peril and Promise, a public media initiative from the WNET Group in New York, reporting on the issues and solutions around climate change. You can learn more at pbs.org slash perilandpromise. Welcome back to Tip of the Iceberg. It's time for Ask Me Anything, where our listeners get a chance to ask me any environmental questions they may have. Submit questions on our Patreon, email, or social media. Questions from patrons go to the front of the line, so be sure to sign up today at patreon.com slash the sweaty penguin. Now, we've got a special treat today. We have one of our listeners on the line, Nicole. Nicole, how are you? Hi, how are you? I'm good. So you have a question for us? Yeah, I'm just, I'm really curious your thoughts. So obviously there is the upcoming UN climate change conference in Egypt. And I really just am curious how you think all of the governments could really come together and come up with like, some sort of bigger global solution. Obviously, global governance is 
is really hard, let alone almost like impossible because obviously countries feel really differently, but I feel like this year there's just been so many global effects that I just think it's really becoming much more of a global issue as compared to, you know, country by country. So I'm curious how you think they can best go about that. That's a great question. And I would be a little arrogant to act like I had a real answer to it. But I think that some good things to think about. First off, like you say, there is no global enforcement mechanism. There's no global government. So countries can't really set a policy for the entire world. Uh, The closest they can come is creating treaties, creating agreements, um, finding ways to hold each other accountable. But even that uh, country has no legally binding mechanism to force them to follow through with a treaty. Um, You can sanction them, you can start wars, though I hope that wouldn't happen, but um, you can't necessarily force someone to follow through with a treaty. So I think that what I would hope to see come out of this conference, last year there was a lot of emphasis on coal, and this was, I believe, the first time the word coal was actually included in the final draft agreement from the conference. And there was kind of a big whoop about the fact that it originally had the phrase phase out coal, and then China and India kind of were singled out for pushing a switch to make it say phase down coal as opposed to phase out. And this got a lot of attention. And to me, it was a little overblown in the sense that, first of all, since these treaties don't have any... Uh, enforcement mechanism, whether you're phasing down or phasing out, it's kind of all the same until you get to the very end, in which case, at any point, countries can make a new treaty. But also, the words oil and gas have never been in one of these documents. And it's really a lot of the more wealthy nations of the world that are relying on oil and gas, but not necessarily needing coal anymore. Whereas uh, China and India, which are certainly large economies, but also still developing in some ways, were continuing to use coal and they really were getting singled out for that. So what I would hope comes out of this year is actual acknowledgement of oil and gas as major contributors as well in some way. And I don't know exactly what that looks like. I think it's an interesting time for that discussion, given the Russian invasion of Ukraine and how that's upended global oil markets. Um, But certainly there's been a lot of progress on the clean energy front recently. And I would hope to see that actually become more of a global conversation that we can actually point to something and say, okay, here's the direction that the world wants to go with regard to oil and natural gas. The other thing that's likely going to come up is um, climate financing. A lot of developing countries are very wary because um, the wealthier countries of the world pledged um, billions of dollars to them in support and that hasn't been followed through on. And so when you talk about it being a global issue, it absolutely is. And that's maybe, um, in the biggest sense, a global issue, how countries can actually support each other as climate damage takes hold. Yeah, I mean, how do you think they could hold these wealthier countries accountable for like sticking to their word? Yeah, what they've done so far, I guess they had... I think it was around $600 billion of debt that they were going to be repaying to, I believe it was the World Bank or the International Monetary Fund. And they basically said, we're halting all our payments on this debt until this climate finance issue gets resolved. So it may be a big part of this COP27 conference of what we do about climate financing. I think that's a great conversation to have. I just hope it doesn't take away from some of these other important conversations about the actual mitigation of climate change and cutting greenhouse gas emissions, because this is a conversation about adaptation, which is equally important, but um, also not more important, if that makes sense. We really need to address all of this, and 
I think we can. I hope we do. Yeah, me too. Well, thank you so much for answering my question. Yeah, thank you so much for joining us. I appreciate it. Thank you all for listening to Tip of the Iceberg. By the way, if you have any question that you want answered live on the show where we can hear your voice, I thought this was awesome. So let me know. Shoot me an email. Shoot me a message. We can absolutely make that happen. Take two minutes, help out the show, and get a shout out at the end of the show by leaving a five-star rating and review on Apple or Podcast Addict, or join our Patreon at patreon.com slash thesweatypenguin. Doing either earns you a special shout out at the end of the show. Joining the Patreon gets you merch, bonus content, and your questions move to the front of the line for Tip of the Iceberg. The Sweaty Penguin is presented by Peril and Promise, a public media initiative from the WNET Group in New York, reporting on the issues and solutions around climate change. You can learn more at pbs.org slash perilandpromise. The opinions expressed in this podcast are those of the host and guests. They do not necessarily reflect the opinions or views of Peril and Promise or the WNET group. Thank you all for listening, and I'll see you on Friday for a deep dive on grocery bags. The number 3.5% comes from Dr. Erica Chenoweth. Who is not Christian Chen? Whoops. Who is not Christian Chenoweth? Kristen Chenoweth. Who is not Christian Chenoweth's? Whoops. <laughs>